May the Lord Jesus give you his peace. We hear St. John the Baptist this morning, Behold the Lamb of God. And there is a call in that for us, for sure, to behold Jesus under this aspect, specifically under a Eucharistic aspect. Uh, this is Father Lapide commenting on really the, the, the great tact of St. John the Baptist to his own disciples, who were very, very devoted to him. Not all of them followed our Lord at this time. Some were perhaps a bit jealous of John's prerogatives and stuck with him and later were sent to Jesus and are you the one who is to come or are we to look for another? But this is Father Lapide. When the Baptist spoke thus, it was as though he said to his disciples, why do you follow me? Follow him who is the Lamb of God, the ransom of the world. Hence note the prudence and modesty of John. He does not compel or urge his disciples to follow Christ, but only points him out to them that they might the more ardently pursue so great a good when it was discovered by themselves and hold fast to it more faithfully. Like a man who, when a jewel is being sold for a small price, points out to merchants how great is its worth and causes them of their own accord to long to purchase it. Hence Chrysostom says, they followed not by any exhortations, for that would have been suspect, but by hearing alone. So to get at the aspect which uh, our saint for the day, St. Elizabeth Ann Seton, uh, realized as an educator, and she would phrase it as such, uh, as a teacher. When you ask too much at first, you often gain nothing at last. And if the heart is lost, all is lost. A very important point in evangelization. If the heart is lost, all is lost. Because the wall goes up, and oftentimes families parents or even sons and daughters, depends on which point the evangelization is coming through because a lot of the generations have been lost. <clears throat> uh, once the wall is up, okay, I'm done. At this level, I'm done. You're not receiving anything. And consequently, to prayer, to prayer and penance, prayer and penance, prayer and penance. And to unite in that as well with others that are also doing the same task. But nevertheless, so there's different pastoral, obviously, <clears throat> strategies, and there's also different souls, what soul can receive what. Pope Francis certainly leans towards this side in terms of the needle bent way over. If the heart is lost, all is lost, even to the point of saying, I'm not trying to convert you to an atheist. What's he trying to do? He's trying to love him. In that, in some loving the other, there's got to be the behold the Lamb of God implicit in that. Otherwise, it's not authentic love. But at the same time, if you think that I'm trying to convert you, you're lost. Your heart is up, or the, the walls are up. Consequently, uh, there's a lot, a lot of kind of talk about these kinds of things, but to see them in certain perspective. This is a Sacrosancta, Sacrosanctum Concilio 10, which will get at this aspect of Behold the Lamb of God, because in that, there can be for us something of a Eucharistic evangelization. And um, it will come down to this. For the goal of apostolic endeavor is that all who are made sons of God by faith and baptism should come together to praise God in the midst of his church, to take part in the sacrifice and to eat the Lord's Supper. So what we're at about this morning at the, the Mass, of course, is for believers. It's for believers. The Eucharist is for believers. You're not to approach the sacred table unless you believe that this is the Christ, the Lamb of God. Uh, at the same time, Everything, all the church's activity is coming from what we're doing here this morning. The Holy Mass. The liturgy in its turn moves the faithful filled with the Paschal sacraments to be one in holiness. It prays that they hold fast in their lives to what they have grasped by their faith. The renewal in the Eucharist of the covenant between the Lord and man draws the faithful and sets them aflame with Christ's insistent love. We'll hear that both from the prayer after Holy Communion this morning, and also in the words of St. Elizabeth Ann Seton as well. From the liturgy, and especially from the Eucharist, grace is poured forth upon us as from a fountain, and the sanctif sanctification of men in Christ, and the glorification of God, to which all other activities of the church are directed as toward their end, are achieved with maximum effectiveness. And so we'll go on, and um, different theologians will work off this. In fact, a document from the Bishop of, uh, Bishops of Texas, which this one theologian, David Schindler, will pick up and write in Communio some years back about towards a Eucharistic evangelization. He, he wonders basically this, which is certainly relevant to us. 
it becomes appropriate in conclusion to ask with Mission Texas, that's where the document came from, whether evangelization's biggest task may not be with respect to Catholics themselves. Uh, the biggest task may very well be that of inspired. So this is from the document. The biggest task may very well be that of inspiring active Catholics to fall in love with Jesus, Eucharistic Jesus, to be converted to him, to make him central to their lives, to imitate him and to share their experience of him with others. Hence, behold the Lamb of God. So that's really a point of consideration. It's certainly a point in which we're involved with in the Institute in terms of what take, what tact. Uh, we're called to be missionaries. How's that going to play out? Perhaps both, perhaps one, perhaps the other. Uh, but nevertheless, we can see the great impetus towards this Eucharistic evangelization because without this kind of consummated faith, the passions of, the interior passions of man really have the day. Hence, uh, oftentimes, the gift of God's grace is lost. Second point this morning is the questions of the disciples posed to our Lord. Where are you staying? Where are you staying? And in that, literally, you could translate it as, where do you bide? And that abide is very, very significant later in the Last Supper discourse, because where are you staying? I'm staying in you. You're not ready to hear that yet, but that's what's happening. I'm staying in you. I'm abiding in you. Abide in me and I in you. He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit. For without me, you can do nothing. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love. So that's the index. This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. You have not chosen me, but I have chosen you and have appointed you that you should go and bear fruit and that your fruit should abide. So this, where do you abide? Eventually, you'll find out I abide in you and you in me and that you go bearing fruit and that fruit abides. In other words, that evangel evangelical effort to transmit the good that uh, I've given you, primarily in the Eucharist, uh, also is given to others. Here's uh, St. Elizabeth Ann Seton. In Holy Communion, our hearts are the tabernacle of divinity, and we should carefully guard the case containing so precious a jewel. And it gets at the aspect of proper thanksgivings and also longing for and gratitude of the gift. Uh, but she'll also go on to talk about how uh, the indwelling Christ, and that's also something that we need to, to care for and to set our eyes on, um, but this is, again, Mother Seton with regard to the Blessed Sacrament. May I ever find in his adorable sacrament the same ardent wish, the same fervent desire to be for eternity united with Jesus. And that's the perspective that we attempt to cultivate, that the, the longing for our Lord in the Blessed Sacrament continues, expands, and really exponentially grows into this desire to be with Jesus. And so consequently, going back to St. John the Baptist, why do you follow me? Look at what you're missing. Look at what you're missing. And that's our efforts at evangelization and getting the word out about the Christ present in our day. Thank you.